All right, good morning. Welcome to Mount Side Community Church. Good to see everybody here this morning. Thank you for coming out, even though it's spring break. You should all be on vacation. Uh, I'm going on vacation this Wednesday. Uh, Pastor Dave will be preaching next week, so that's really the week to attend. Uh, if, you're, if you're thinking, oh, that's weird, he just called him Pastor Dave. We announced, uh, we hired Dave last week. He was gracious enough to come on board here, so we're pretty excited about that. So if you missed that announcement, go online and you can always watch um, backup sermons. You should be getting those in your e-newsletter. So if you're not getting an e-newsletter from us, you might want to consider one of these cards. It's a connect card. You can put your name, your uh, email, your text. We'll get you more information about the church. <clears throat> and we'd be happy to uh, connect you to the help that you need. If you need help, um, whether it be counseling, a life group, um, all kinds of ways that we can help you in, in your Christian life. And then we'll give you more information about the church as well. Hey, we're, I forgot to do these the last couple of weeks. We're doing spiritual fitness cards. So if you come into the church, you'll see this on one of the tables. You also get this in the e-newsletter. So I'm going to read the spiritual, uh, the spiritual fitness challenge. This was an idea I had at like 2 in the morning uh, last year. So most of my 2 in the morning ideas are bad. But this seems to be working. So we ask you to grab a card so that you can be working on your spiritual life during the week and not just on Sunday morning. Today's spiritual challenge card, practice encouragement. Send an encouraging text to at least one person every day this week. You know, that's not very hard to do, honestly. Um, but I think what it could be is a point in which you um, take your eyes off of yourself for just a moment, force yourself to think about somebody else, and then just send them a text of encouragement. Tell them you're praying for them. Tell them you love them. Tell them something. I sent a, an encouragement text this week to someone who I'm like, I'm like, like I text someone an encouragement. I'm like, this, this dude gets all kinds of encouragement. This is, this is like a white noise to him. And immediately I got back, thank you so much. I haven't heard that in forever. And it's like, huh, wow. I wonder if we're not encouraging enough. I wonder if we're not saying enough kind things to one another. So please do that. Uh, you can fill out a Connect card. We don't actually pass an offering plate here at Mountainside. We have offering boxes on the back. If you don't yet know Christ is your Savior, please don't be a giver yet. You need to come to Christ first and foremost. If you're part of a church family and you've connected here, uh, the Bible's pretty clear about giving unto the Lord, and so you can give in those. You can give online. Um, you can just hand straight up cash to Brian, one of our elders, and just uh, if you've got a money tree in the backyard, whatever you do, uh, do it joyfully unto the Lord, and uh, we appreciate all of your giving. A few quick announcements. Um, if you have a bulletin, uh, some of these are in here too. First, I was able to get a deal on some books. So um, I'm offering 12 ordinary men and 12 extraordinary women for $5 each. Just take one, put the $5 in the offering box. Excellent resource, excellent book. If you're looking for a book to read uh, currently, uh, they're both by MacArthur. They're really good. And then uh, my special gift to you, you don't have the $5, take one. Just take it, read it, uh, be encouraged in your spiritual life, number one. Number two, uh, we're trying to save money this Easter. That's always how you want to start. So now, uh, on a serious note, typically we'll print up those little uh, business cards and we'll give you a business card and say, here's a card, invite a friend to Easter. And you know what happens to those cards? Number one, you smile when you take it from me, and then you put it like under your chair. So either I pick them up and throw them away, or you take it home and throw it away, or you give it to your neighbor and he or she throws it away. So rather than print up a bunch of cards, we do have a few bigger cards uh, printed in the foyer that you could grab. Uh, later today, you, each of you will receive a text message. I'm going to do my best to text a bunch of people. So if you don't get one, text me by tonight, and I will text you back. If you receive one, I'm asking you to text at least five people in the church who you know. So the text message, this was Kathleen came up with this. Absolutely genius. It's basically a picture. Um, so I'm old. So it's like a like a photo pick JPEG thing that you just write your friend, hey, Todd, uh, Dawson here, I'd love to invite you to Easter with me. And then just add, it's a photo, just add the photo. And it's everything that they need. That is 
free to do. And I got to be honest with you, um, this is how smart Kathleen is. I wouldn't, I don't go to my next door neighbor and say, knock, 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 uh, white shirt, black name badge, Elder Lang, here's a card to you. I'd like to invite you to church. I don't do it. So I print these cards and I ask you to do it and I, I don't really do it. But a text message with a photo link, absolutely. I'll text that to anybody. Um, great, awesome. There you go. So that's coming. And then third, here's the serious thing that I need to talk about before I get into the sermon this morning. So uh, we've been blessed here at Mountainside, super big blessing to have this building. If you're new or newish to Mountainside, welcome. We met at DePoli for a long time. Then this thing called COVID happened. Then we got kicked out of DePoli. Then we got to meet at a park. And we were actually renting this facility on Sunday evenings. Sunday evenings was like selling manna to the Israelites in the wilderness. People wanted more meat. So we ended up that the church that was here folded and we bought this building. We bought it with cash, so we have no debt. We own everything that you see around us. So we're not trying to hurt you or take advantage of you. But we need to, every now and again, do an addition to the building. And so we're going to add something to the building We've already paid for it, actually. We've already ordered it up, and it should be installed in the next two weeks. But I'm going to take a one-time offering. So what I want you to do is reach into the person's wallet or purse in front of you, and I want you to give unto the Lord like you have always really wanted to give, and just sign their name on a check or whatever. So in a, on a serious note, we're going to take an offering. We're not passing a plate or anything. This is just between you and the Lord. You can give online. You can give on the box, whatever you want. We, uh, we realize that being a really tight congregation, we only have one kind of big room to meet in. And it happens to be upstairs because we're a two-story church. And we're finding more and more that we have people with some mobility issues and they can't, they can't get up there. We also used to have a young man who came to our church who was in a wheelchair. And I'm not looking at someone who wants to join our children's ministry and say, I'm sorry, we can't get you upstairs. So just like what Jesus did in his day, we're actually going to dig a hole into the roof and we're going to start lowering people. No. So we looked into an elevator and you know what, what I found out about an elevator? A little bit pricey. Just, just a little bit pricey. So we've actually already ordered up, it's $10,000. We're ordering a chair lift that will be installed in that stairwell. So you can ride up the stairs safely. If you have any mobility issues, if you can't get up the stairs you can ride up the stairs and join us for anything in this church. We care about you here at Mountainside. It was, it was not going to be appropriate for any of our elders to look at anybody who comes into our church and say, I'm sorry, we're doing a super cool thing up there, but because of your mobility issues, you can't join us. That is unacceptable here. So it's already ordered up. It will be installed. I'm hoping here in the next 7 to 14 days. So it's $10,000. If you're sitting on 30 We'll take the whole 30. That's fantastic. But if you want to give towards helping those who have mobility issues, go ahead and give into the offering and just either let Brian know or put in the offering or just tag it mobility issues or something, and we'll put it towards that. So thank you for bearing with us in that. Uh, but just, we just want to make sure that everybody feels welcome here, no matter what your situation, no matter what your status in life, no matter how hurting or not hurting you are. If you're rejoicing this morning, we want to rejoice with you. If you're having a hard time, we want to weep with you. We want to help you in any way that we can. And uh, sometimes in life, my dad always used to tell me, and this has been very, very true. My dad used to say, Dawson, if money can buy you out of the problem, you don't have a real problem. So the great news about a chairlift is money, money fixes the problem. So that's not a real problem. You and I both know that the problems that we face in life, you can't write a check and get out of it. It's a wayward son or daughter. It's someone who's hurting. It's a spouse or a loved one who there's a wreck in the relationship. There's all kinds of things like that that you just can't fix with money. And that's where we have to lean on God. We have to trust him. We have to go to him and say, Father, we need you. We need you in this moment to work in a bigger way than what just a stupid check could fix. And so um, we're actually in Luke chapter 4 this morning. We're walking through the book of Luke. We only have about 70, uh, verse, uh, uh, 70 sermons through Luke. We're on like 10. So if you are uh, just joining us, you haven't missed much. We're in Luke chapter 4, verse 31 today. Fascinating passage. Super cool passage. Really scary passage. 
and totally outside of normal passage. So welcome to Mountainside Community Church, Luke chapter 4, verse 31. And he, Jesus, went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and as he was teaching them on the Sabbath, they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. So last week, uh, Jesus, this was great, uh, Pastor Dave preached last week, Jesus sits, reads a scroll from uh, the book of Isaiah, tells people the truth, and what do they gift him with? They gift him with a near push off of a cliff. How fantastic is that? You tell people the truth, and they hate you. Do we live in a day and age like that today? We absolutely do. Is it going to get worse? Yeah, it's going to get a lot worse. I'm sorry, but you tell people the truth nowadays. The truth divides. The truth makes things worse. The truth often makes you enemies. The truth brings anger out of people and shows you their idolatry. It shows you that they want to serve them, themselves instead of the Lord. Now, instead of railing, I don't really like to do that here at Mountainside. We don't like point the finger at the other side who we can't change and we yell at. And that's like, like politics does that. And it's super annoying to me. So if you're dealing with someone who won't uh, listen to the truth, let me tell you the secret way to make them listen to the truth. Nothing. You can't do that. It doesn't work that way. I don't care how much you tell someone the truth, badger them, arm bar them, write them a text, write them an email, yell at them, scream at them. If they don't want to hear the truth, they're not going to hear the truth. And so all day long, you could either point, 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 and worry about the other guy who's not believing the truth, or you got a couple options. You could cut them off. That's an option. You could pray for them. That's an option. You could love them. That's an option. Romans 2, 4 tells me that the kindness of God is meant to lead people to repentance. It might be that you need to try a little bit more kindness. But it might be that in my humanity, I want the silver bullet that makes someone believe the truth, and I just don't have that. That's up to God. He needs to work in someone's life. And I can either bang my head against a wall and keep going at them, or I can just allow God to work in some way that he needs to work. But here on Mountainside, I don't like to point at others. I like to point at myself. And so rather than you being all concerned about someone else not believing the truth, how about you go home tonight and you believe the truth? Because I'll tell you what, I meet so many people who are so concerned about someone else, and there's this big log right in their eye, and you're like, you're worried about that dude? You've got bigger problems than that guy. You've got real problems in your life, and you need to face those problems, and you need to fix those problems. I see this on social media all the time. People ranting and raving about the White House, and their house is in complete, total disaster. So listen, it might be time to let somebody else go. They don't know the truth. You're right. They're wrong. But let them be. Love them, pray for them, be kind for them, and then you start repenting of the things that you need to repent of and change your mind about some stuff. After Jesus' near-death experience, he just goes about his business because no man can stop what Jesus will do to complete the Father's will. He goes down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee. Last week, Jesus was in Nazareth. Nazareth is up in the mountains. Nazareth is actually south of Capernaum. Capernaum is a city on the Sea of Galilee. Nazareth sits at, so why does the Bible say, and he went down to Capernaum when he's going north. Nazareth sits at about 1,400 feet. Galilee, right at Capernaum, sits at 700 feet below sea level. So in about a 22-mile journey that Jesus walks, he descends about 2,100 feet. The Sea of Galilee at 700 feet below sea level runs, feeds the Jordan River, and then feeds where into, finally, the Dead Sea, which sits where? 1,400 feet below sea level is the lowest point on earth. So Jesus, here's interesting, we never say we go up uh, to Southern California, but in Jesus' day, when you walk everywhere, when you walk, you know when you go up. And when you walk, you know when you go down. 
or ride your bike around South Reno. You think South Reno is really flat? Ride your bike around South Reno, and then you'll be like, huh, I, I'm going uphill. It might be a little uphill, but I know I'm going uphill. So why are people astonished at his teaching? Because any teacher during his day, any rabbi that was teaching would have had some, author, uh, some authority um, that Jesus, Jesus doesn't have the authority in the sense that he doesn't have a title. So he's not a rabbi. He's not like a known teacher, but he's teaching with authority because the rabbis of that day would have taught and they would have said, and such and such, Rabbi Shmuel says, blah, blah, blah. And Rabbi, this guy says, blah, blah, blah. But Jesus is just saying stuff. He's not referring to other rabbis. He does, he's not like giving his sources. Like he's saying stuff and he is the source. And so people are, are, are stunned. And then we get to a passage that's just welcome to mountainside. Now it gets weird. Verse 33. And in the synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! Ha! What have you do to what do you have to do with us Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the holy one of God. But Jesus rebuked him saying, "Be silent and come out of him." And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, "What is this word?" For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out of him. And reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. So I realize that in our day and age, this is a weird passage. Because I don't know that anybody in this room in the last week dealt with a demon-possessed person that you knew was demon-possessed. I don't mean you pointing a finger at a political pundit who you don't like and saying, well, clearly they're demon-possessed. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people who live in a community and they all go, oh yeah, the demon-possessed dude, he just lives four doors down. That's where he lives. We live in a scientific world here in America and in a scientific world, there's little room for the spiritual unseen otherworldly kind of things. And yet, we see people walking downtown mumbling to themselves. We see people with severe mental health issues. We see people hurting themselves and dealing with illnesses that we don't have answers to. Are some of those people demon-possessed? Absolutely. Are all of those people demon-possessed? No way. Could it be that what we call mental illness could be demon possession? Could it be that there are demon possessed people around us? Absolutely, there could be. But before we dig into this, what I want to say is it might just be that someone's just hurting. If I can break my arm, and nobody would judge me for breaking my arm because I live in a fallen world, maybe I can break my brain. I just don't have an answer to a broken brain right now. And it might just be that I'm, I'm just hurting. I don't think it's on our, uh, on our shoulders to like declare who is hurting in a good way, who is hurting in a bad way, who is demon-possessed, who is demon-oppressed, or other. I think we need to be really, really careful about this because people just get physically broken. And that's okay. That's part of living in this fallen world that we call life. So this is the first demon-possessed person that we encounter in Luke chapter 4 here. We were already introduced to who? Satan himself. In earlier in Luke 4, remember, the temptation of Jesus is not just, him, just Jesus wandering around in the wilderness wondering if he should buy a new Dodge Ram. And like, he's not content with his truck and he wants the new one. So that's a temptation. No, it's Satan himself talking to Jesus and tempting him, telling him things that are part true, part not, trying to get Jesus to fall. 
And really with that victory, Jesus wins the entire battle, but it's really not until the cross where Jesus will crush the serpent's head. Now the point of this passage is not to go into demonism, and I do not have the time to cover everything the Bible says. If you want that, then you will attempt my lecture, uh, The Christian and Demonic Activity. Mark it down now, Wednesday, October 11th at 6.30 p.m. We're taking three or four key DARE. uh, So our DARE is our men's group, but uh, three or four of our DARE men are going to be open to not only the men and women of the church, but also other churches. We have one coming up. Uh, Dave is going to uh, teach on one. I gave him a good one, uh, why there has to be a hell. And uh, and then we're going to have another one, and then I'm on the Christian and demonic activity. So be there for that if you want uh, a deeper kind of inlay into this. But I, I do think we need to answer two questions this morning. One, what is a demon? And two, who can be possessed? I think those are, those are important in this text. Question number one, what is a demon? Satan was divinely created as a perfect angel, but as a result of his pride and desire to be like the infinite God, he fell from glory, and sin entered into the universe at that time. Satan is the open and declared enemy of God, and he rules the demonic world in this present age. Now, we also know that he rules this earth. How do we know that? Because when Satan talks to Jesus, he offers him the kingdoms of this world. If you offer something to someone and you don't actually have it, it ain't a temptation. So if Satan goes to Jesus and says, I want to offer you all the kingdoms, and and Jesus goes, well, actually, my father and I are kind of already own those, so this is not much of a temptation to be given into. No, Jesus has to fight that temptation Say no, because Satan does own this world. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 13. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God in the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence, and in your midst, and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor, and I cast you to the ground. God speaking to Satan, probably one of the most beautiful, highest angels that God had ever created. And he's saying, I cast you out because you were so proud of your beauty. Is that a problem in America today? Wow, that's a big problem. I want to be careful as Christians. Sometimes we get on our high horses about stuff that They might be a sin, some of it's not, and we start harping on certain sin. And the very thing that cast Satan out of heaven, just a little thing called pride, we just sort of overlook. That's not okay for us to do. Satan is not God's counterpart. They aren't equal rivals. God and Satan aren't yin and yang. They aren't opposite sides of a dice. God was not created and he is infinite. Satan was created in his finite. God would use no energy in defeating Satan. God doesn't have to use any energy up for anything that he does. Satan is extremely limited because he serves under the rule and reign of God. And though Satan is allowed to create havoc here on earth, he is very limited by God. Satan also has fallen angels called demons. Jesus is dealing with an us. Notice that word us. Jesus is dealing with multiple demons here in this who has who have infiltrated this man's life. Demons are fallen angels who followed Satan's rebellion against God. Some are active in promoting Satan's program of opposition here on earth. 
while others, uh, we find out in multiple times, again, come to my lecture in October, that some of these demons are so evil, they were actually locked in hell and will be in hell for the rest of eternity because of their level of evil. Demons seek to thwart the purposes of God. They can inflict physical suffering on mankind. They can also possess unbelievers. And they certainly promote false doctrines. So question number two, we beg the question, who can be possessed? Well, that's a scary question. Satan is the ruler of this world. We know that. When these demons ask Jesus, what have you do to, with us? Have you come to destroy us? Another way to say this would be the demons are saying, hey, we're busy here. You don't belong here. You belong over there. Why are you infiltrating our space? What did we do to deserve you to come on over here? Why don't you go your way? Leave us alone. We'll stay where we're at. We'll have our party. You can have your party. There's no need to destroy us. That's scary. <clears throat> we see many demon possessions throughout the Gospels. Jesus is often dealing with um, people who are demonized, often casting out demons, um, always showing that he has power over the demons. Demons can possess people. We have many instances of a demon possessing an unbeliever. What we never have in Scripture is an example of a demon possessing a believer. Why is that? Any non-believer can be possessed by a demon because their spirit is empty. Believers are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, so they cannot be possessed. So if a demon cannot possess a believer, what can a demon do to a believer? I want to back up just a moment. I want to read this verse. You should already have this verse highlighted in your phone your app, your Bible. And by the way, we're always giving out Bibles. You can take ours home. Ephesians 6.12. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Has anybody ever read that verse? Or, or I just read that to you and you were like, wow, I never heard that verse in my entire life. Okay, I read that verse a bunch. And you know what amazes me about that verse? Here's what we do as Christians. Ephesians 6, we, no, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Awesome. Okay, so here's my life. I wrestle not against flesh and blood. I wrestle not against flesh and blood. And the very next thing that happens to me, I treat the rest of my life as what? Oh, now I'm wrestling against flesh and blood. The Bible talks about a man who looks in a mirror and then turns around and forgets what he looks like. We often do that with Scripture. We should know better. So we say we wrestle not against flesh and blood, and most of us in this room are spending most of our energy battling against what? Flesh and blood. And the Bible tells me that's not what you're actually wrestling against. Here's where I think. I don't think we're that dumb. I can be. You're not. But I do think it's easier for me to wrestle against flesh and blood because I sort of understand it, and I don't really want to wrestle against, like, Something I don't even know, see, understand. I, I just don't, I just don't get, get that. So we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We immediately forget it, and we scream at flesh and blood. This battle is happening to believers, not just unbelievers. And there are many ways that a demon can attack you. So for my full, you're going to have to be here in October, I just have time to discuss one today. So the one area that I want to discuss today that a demon is attacking you, will continue to attack you, and will never stop, is your mind, your thought life, the things that you believe. Your actions will follow from your belief systems. That's the bottom line. You all believe certain things. 
And based on your belief, you then act in certain ways. Now, sometimes through sin, selfishness, emotional turmoil, we do act in ways and, and we're like, I just acted in that way and I don't even believe that. Like that, that was wrong. You know what that's called? An apology. Just apologize and keep moving on. You don't got to beat yourself up over it. And the person who you sin against, they're a sinner too. So they don't need to beat you up over it either. We can apologize. Man, I'm so sorry. I apologize to you. I acted in a way that I don't even believe. And I don't know why. Well, the why is your flesh. That's why. You're acting out of the flesh instead of acting out of the spirit. <clears throat> when Satan comes to, and, and by the way, I don't think there's anybody in this room who Satan is ever going to go to. I don't think any of us are that important. I'm guessing Satan was attacking Billy Graham. Like that's, like I'm thinking Satan's on him, but you got a demon somewhere around you because there's a bunch of them. And so they're tagged on you, tag you're it. When Satan is in the Garden of Eden, tempting Adam and Eve, Really, the whole point of that temptation is, I don't know if that's what God said. I don't know. And that could be reinterpreted. I mean, there's many versions of the Bible, and I don't know that that, it, that's a pretty staunch level of interpretation on that. I think what God really meant was just sort of, um, he's good being him, and he kind of doesn't want you to be like him. And so, you know what, if you eat that apple, was it an apple? Probably not. By the way, anybody have a guess on what it was? Thank you. Someone listen. I preached this sermon, a sermon like this, like 83 years ago, and one guy remembers. I think it's a, I think it's a pomegranate because the pomegranates were um, whittled. They were at the bottom of the robes. Uh, there were pomegranates on the bottom of the robes of the priests who went into the Holy of Holies. And what one of my professors used to say is that pomegranate on the bottom of that robe, because you went in the Holy of Holies, and you had a bunch of sin in you, what happened? A straight lightning bolt to the face is what happened. So you're dead because you have un unconfessed sin. And he thought that the pomegranate was a reminder of the first fall and that that would remind the priest, that pomegranate would remind, I need to repent of my sin. I need to be pure before the Lord. I need to push off anything that is a sin in my life. Eh, maybe, maybe not. Let's say it's an apple. So God said, God said, you know, you eat that and you're going to be as awesome as him. That's really what God meant. But you see, it's all here. Satan wants you to believe things that are like a piece of a truth, a half truth. He'll sell you a piece of a truth if you'll buy the rest of the lie. Your mind is a battleground. And, and I'll tell you this, we spend far more time taking this in than this in. And one of my challenges, well, I'm going to get to the challenge. Let me just hold on. I still have a little bit. There's a battle going for your mind. Demons really do still exist on this planet, and they really do want to make you ineffective. If you're not yet a believer in Christ, a demon has you already and doesn't want you to believe in Christ. If you're already saved, what a demon would love for you is to be completely ineffective. Fine, you're saved, but you ain't getting any farther than that. I would, uh, a, a demon couldn't love a Christian more who is completely self-centered, selfish, spends all their time on themselves, uh, golfs every Sunday instead of being at church, uh, doesn't serve anybody, doesn't give anything, constantly online, constantly comparing him or her, him or herself or herself to others, is completely ego-centered, full of pride, all of it. That's like a demon going, awesome. Go ahead and believe in Christ. By the way, the demons uh, have better theology than all of us. I mean, look at the theology that comes out of the mouth of a demon before it even comes out of the mouth of the apostles. This demon is saying things that are more true, and the, the apostles are like, we don't actually know who this dude is. 
We're just sort of following him. He feeds people. He does magic tricks. We're not sure. And then when we think we're sure, we deny him anyways. And we just keep going about our lives. Like, it's amazing what the demons actually know. So what are you supposed to do to battle demonic influence specifically over your mind? One, you must fill your mind with God's word. Charles Spurgeon used to say, if, if a needle pricked you, you would bleed. I'm going to give a piece of candy if you know this one. You would bleed what? Biblene. You would bleed the Bible out of you. Listen to me. You don't, if you don't know this, how do you answer this? Jesus answers the Bible to Satan himself. I've started this recently, and I, I wish I would have been smarter earlier in my life. I've started like answering Bible in my head. Just as situations come up, as people say things or do things, just saying like a Bible verse or saying something or saying a general principle or a practice that the Bible would recommend for me. Just talking Bible in my head. Because in my nature, what do I want to talk? In my nature, I want to talk eye for eye and flesh for uh, two. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, flesh for flesh. You hurt me, I hurt you worse. You get me, I get you worse. That's flesh. You, unless you know this, you won't be able to answer spirit. You won't be able to do it. Make a challenge. Be in the scripture. Start speaking scripture. You need to put things in your mind so that you can battle the demonic whispers and lies that are coming into you 24-7. Two, you must pray. Ephesians 6.18 says, pray at all times. I'm not sure. I used to think, well, how do you do that? You, like, like you're praying, but you're like, you got to walk over there. So for me, prayer has become more like constant communication with the Father. Just a talk in my head. Father, what do you think about that? Well, what does the Bible say? I'm praying for this person. I'm praying for that person. I'm praying for myself. What am I supposed to be doing? Just talking to the Father about the situations you're in. Father, I want to throw my golf club right now. What should I do about that? I don't know. Maybe he'll help you out. We must be praying. Jesus felt it necessary to often get away and pray. If he needed to do that, then I'm probably going to need to do that. Number three, you must be with the bride of Christ. The church is here for your protection, for fellowship, love, encouragement, correct teaching, prayer, communion, pastors, elders who are shepherding you and helping you. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking some one to devour. You do not put yourself alone. You do not put yourself away from the body of Christ. I think, I, I honestly got to say, I think one of the best things Satan ever did is um, belittle the body of Christ, belittle the church, belittle the bride of Christ, and get people. Uh, I, I mean, church has got to be one of the most unpopular things in America today. It's got to be. You are supposed to be part of a church. You're supposed to be serving people in the church. You're supposed to be serving people in the church who annoy you. That's how you grow. You show love and consideration and compassion for people. And number four, this is a big one. You must be willing to be honest with yourself. Your pride and your arrogance will be your downfall. You, it's, it, you got to. I, I, I'm just saying, just call a time out on yourself. So for me, this is what I do. I've already tried blah, 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 fix my problems, scream at the kids. So I don't, I, I used to, kids, time out. Now I give myself a time out. So here's typical what I would do. I hate to say this on camera, it'll be used against me, but it's what I do. So if, if you're getting annoyed around your home, you call a time out on who? Yourself. And so I go into my garage, I put down a chair, I open my beer fridge, I grab, hopefully I have a good beer in there and not just like a Michelob Ultra. And so then I sit down with a beer on a chair in the garage and I just stop and pray. Father, what is going on right now? 
I am upset. I am mad. This is my whole world. As you get angrier, by the way, Satan wants your whole world to pinpoint into one thing. It's the dumbest thing you could do. Your world is not defined by that one thing. That one thing is probably nothing. Because guess what? Shocker. I know you've never heard this. We battle not against flesh and blood. Thank you, Father, while I sit and drink this delicious beer that you remind me. I'm not even battling flesh and blood. How stupid of me that just 30 minutes ago, I think I'm battling flesh and blood. Why? Because the flesh and blood around me is not behaving in the way that I want them to behave. But I'm not battling flesh and blood. Oh, okay. Then what else, Father? What else would you like to speak to me? How do you want to use this in my life? Because me yelling at other people isn't going to change anything. Go beat your head, not that wall. That wall is not brick. Uh, you'll go through that wall. Beat your head against this wall up here on stage, the wood wall. That's about how far you're going to get. So it would be far better to call a timeout on yourself and say, Father, what are you doing in my heart? What do you want to show me? What do you want to show me that's much, much deeper than this one little microscopic moment in my life? Call a timeout and be honest with yourself. And he arose, verse 38, and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her, rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now when the sun was setting, all those who, had were, who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. He laid his hands on every one of them, and they were healed. And demons came out of them. You were, you were the son of God, but he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Christ. All right, I'll end with this. People are getting healed. Some of them have demons. It's not your job to ever say with someone who has a sickness, you're probably sick because you're in sin. You're probably sick because you have a demon. Please don't do that. That is not, Jesus might do that. You know, being God and all. Don't do that to somebody. I have heard this done. Like we carrot people like, hey, if you just have enough faith, like your healing is there. And then they lack faith and they don't get healed. And fake preachers say, well, they didn't have enough faith, so they didn't grab their healing. That's called spiritual abuse. Let me bottom line on why God doesn't heal all of us. Let me give you the best, most simple answer that I have. It might not be the Father's will, period. It might not be the Father's will, just seven words. That's built on two truths. One, that God is all-powerful and can heal all of us whenever he wants. And two, God is so loving that what he's doing in your life must flow out of a fountain of love. Listen, Jesus is going to heal these people. He does, right? You, you're, right now you're thinking of all the healings that Jesus does. So Jesus heals a person. That person lived how much longer? Five years? Seven years? Ten years? Twenty years? Okay, let's say they lived 20 more years, and then they did what? They died. My challenge to you, if you're hurting, was Jesus any less with them at the moment of their death than he was at the moment of their healing? No. We just have to die, people. And I'm sorry. But the Bible seems to indicate that that death is your great release. That this is a gracious gift from God that you would not have to live on this planet forever in a state of sin and selfishness and unrighteousness. And I know it hurts. And it's going to hurt to lose people who you love. And you're going to miss them. You'll want to have lunch with them and hang out. We all have to die. We'll all die from various kinds of things. But Jesus is no less with you than he was at the moment that he healed somebody too. He loves you. He's calling you back to himself. And if you really want to learn about heaven, you'll attend Pastor Dave's class. That's coming up and rooted. And uh, I forgot to look up the dates, but it's coming, and you would attend that class. You know what's great? about what's going on right now at this church 
we're offering you tons of biblin. You just got to say yes. Rooted should be packed. Tons of biblical information. And the reason we do that is so that you can tell a demon, no, that's not true. My Bible tells me otherwise. Let's pray. Father God, I do thank you for this morning. I thank you for each person here, whether they be hurting or whether they be rejoicing this morning. We weep with those who weep and we rejoice with those who rejoice. Father, we love them, but most importantly, you love them. And Christ is with us in whatever state that we are in. And we trust that out of the fountain of mercy and love that is the Father's heart, that he is doing the most loving thing for us right now. Thank you, Father, for this time on earth. May we be very wise about what's going on around us and what's going on inside of us. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.